Ladies and gentlemen, it is an incredible honor to welcome you today to the lecture by Professor Philip Ellett. And when I say welcome you, I mean everybody here in the Lautrec Center for International Law, but also mean everybody there, the wider society of the European Society of International Law, who is watching this lecture and listening to this lecture with us today. Now, you know personally what the attractions are of studying Cambridge. For some people, it's punting. For other people, <laughs> it's in the the beautiful picturesque environment. For some people, it's the louder uh, center. For some people, it's the high number of practicing um, ac academics. Others emphasize our strong connections with Cambridge University Press, who co-sponsors these lectures. Yet again, others focus on our strong relations with the Foreign Office, uh, whom we welcome here today. And um, then there is one of the huge, or the biggest attractions we have, Professor Philip Ballett himself. Uh, I really know a lot of people who came to Cambridge to meet Professor Ellett, and rightly so. Well, why? Well, first of all, he's had an illustrious career at the Foreign Office, uh, then in Cambridge as a professor. He's a fellow of the British Academy, a fellow of Trinity College. And nowadays, you can also hear him and learn more about his life in the Eminent Scholars Archive on the website of uh, the law faculty. I think another reason why um, it is such a pleasure to meet Professor Ellett is he, for us foreigners, he embodies what a quintessential English gentleman is all about. He has all the features and characteristics that Jane Austen would ascribe to a <laughs> um, And I encourage you to uh, discover those features yourself. Secondly, this quintessential English gentleman is in fact a revolutionary. But for the revolutionary um, approach of Professor Philip Alice, you don't have to go outside on the barricades. No, the revolution has to take place in the mind. Uh, he always encourages to think differently. And that's why he often argues it has gone wrong with international law, by seeing it as a state-organized society, by seeing it, uh, and for instance, the approach to responsibility that we've taken. And that's why he's such a great professor, because he teaches us to think differently. That's where it all starts, the revolution. And I think finally, the revolution he calls for is not just a revolution of the mind, but also a revolution of the heart. In the European Society of International Law Conference we had here in 2010, uh, Roger O'Keefe gave a talk in which he identified that the one missing thing in the chain of international law was the heart. There was no heart. Now, I encourage you to read Professor Ellis' books, Eunomia, um, The Health of Nations, and several of his other writings. Because if anything, what you find in these writings, it is the human heart. And I find it incredible that a um, legal thinker um, writes in such a way that he always gets me, at the, towards the end of the book, almost in tears, because it is so personable and so moving. Well, having said that, I... Um, wish you a very pleasant lecture listening to the true nature of international law. <coughs> I think I may be able to deal with that. Oh, there it is. Um, right, well, thank you, Sarah, for that introduction, which I can't possibly object to. <laughs> perhaps not entirely agree with. Um, I'm going to start with an obvious proposition. What a wonderful time to be an international lawyer. I think I better repeat that. It's such a peculiar statement. What a wonderful time to be an international lawyer. International law is the law of the world the law of the whole world. And the world, human world, is now changing. Dramatically and dynamically and fundamentally changing. So that's a great challenge for us as international lawyers. What will be the place of law in a human world which is transformed? Well, I've spent the last 40 years on just that problem. 
It seems an extremely eccentric way of spending one's time, and I could have been making money. <laughs> um, but that is literally what I've been doing for the last 40 years. And so it's an interesting problem for all international lawyers now, at least thoughtful international lawyers. As I'm sure you know, there are two sorts of international lawyers. There are thoughtful international lawyers and the rest. <laughs> um, and we're going to forget the rest for the moment. If only we could forget the rest. So I'm assuming that you mostly are lawyers, lawyers of the thoughtful kind. And do remember, the world is made of ideas. And new ideas mean a new world. And that's a big responsibility for those of us who think. It's a privilege and a responsibility that merely by thinking and writing, we are taking part in changing the world. It may seem unlikely on a cold, damp afternoon in Cambridge, but that's actually what we're doing. And I want to refer to point one on the piece of paper that you should have. Um, International law has gone through a series of stages, post-medieval international law. And I identify them here. 1500 to 1750 responded to a new world. And the underlying conceptual structure was humanist. Obviously with religious overtones, but essentially humanist. How should we treat the human race? And then from 1750 to the year 2000, another new world, dominated by states. And it produced its great theory, the Swiss Emirate de Vattel. And that was a theory which put states at the center of the stage, treated them as quasi-persons, and treated the problem of international law as a sort of interpersonal problem between states. And what I'm suggesting here is that from about the year 2000, we're moving into another new world, and we have to respond again. It's a world in which international law will be post vatelian It will have a different conceptual structure. And uh, obviously that's what I'm going to try and indicate to you now, what that will be. So if I was doing this work, what would be a new kind of law for a new kind of human world? One has to face two terrible intellectual problems, which start at point two on the list. Now I'm sure some of you know that there is an enormous problem of social philosophy. What can one do if one studies the human phenomenon? human social phenomenon. And as you also know, in the 19th century, they thought for a while that there could be a science of the human world, a sort of human science, as uh, the French science men, as the French suggested early in the 19th century. There could be social sciences and they would imitate the method of the natural sciences and perhaps find truths and laws about the human world. Well, that then gave rise to an enormous debate later in the century about whether that was a ridiculous fantasy, that there's something about the human world which means that you can't simply treat it as an empirical problem. We're involved in it. And towards the end of the century, the debate focused itself in Germany as what is called the Methodenstreit, the dispute about methods. And that was an enormous theoretical debate about whether it's possible to speak objectively about the human condition. And there were people violently arguing for both sides, yes, we must be able to be objective about the human condition. And on the other side, but it's simply nonsense. You can't. There's no such thing. You can't get outside the human condition if you're a human being. And of course that also gave, because Marx had already suggested this idea, which goes back to Plato, uh, what can be called ideology. 
that you can't talk about any of these things except from your point of view and pushing your point of view. So that you, you would be intrinsically ideological whatever sentence you uttered. If you were a bourgeois, you would utter a bourgeois sentence about the human condition. If you were a ruling class thinker, you would utter a ruling class thought. That was a devastating apparent discovery by Marx. <coughs> As I say, it was perfectly familiar to Plato that this was a problem, that you tend to have the ideas that are in the interest of the group that you belong to. Well, that seemed to mean, and then in the 20th century, the debate continued, most particularly in the work of Max Weber, who tried to find an objectification of social science, which you may or may not think convincing. But that means up till 1920, I can't remember when he died, but thereabouts, um, this was still a great debate. Well, I'm glad to say that it's been solved. <coughs> and we're in this very happy position. Because it was largely, I have to say, a continental debate. It was the, as it were, the epitome of a theoretical debate. It was a theoretical debate about theory. And we in Britain don't go in for that sort of thing very much. Um, we don't go into theory very much, let alone debates about the theory of theory. So the two people I'm quoting here, I have to admit, are British. And these are solutions which, I have to say, it took me 15 years to work all this out. It's comical from my point of view to say it in just a few sentences. Um, so solution number one is the wonderful idea of the mental model. So what we're doing in studying the human condition is trying to create models, like engineers do and scientists do, creating models of social reality. And then that enables us, we can disagree about the models, but that enables us to talk about it, there's something to talk about. Does a particular phenomenon fit the model? And I'll just read what Kenneth Craig of St. John's College, Cambridge, said in The Nature of Explanation. Very sadly, he died shortly afterwards, after 1943. But this had a huge effect. Quote, if the organism carries a small-scale model of external reality and of its own possible actions within its head, it is able to try out various alternatives, conclude which is the best of them react to future situations before they arise, utilize the knowledge of past events in dealing with the present and the future, and in every way to react in a much fuller, safer, and more competent manner to the emergencies which face it. And that is the most wonderful suggestion of his. And that's what we do, nothing more ambitious than that, and nothing less ambitious than that, I'm trying to create models, and I, at the moment I'm going to suggest <coughs> a model for this new world. Solution number two was by uh, another British philosopher, Peter Winch. And he said, you have to accept that ideas are social power. Just accept it. Quote, in this passage, he was answering Karl Popper, who, who suggested that model ideas are just explanations, they have no social significance. And this is Peter Winch's reply, quote, the ways of thinking embodied in institutions govern the way the members of the society studied by the social scientists behave. The idea of war, for instance, was not simply invented by people who wanted to explain what happens when societies come into armed conflict. It is an idea which provides the criteria of what is appropriate in the behavior of members of the conflicting societies. In other words, you act out the models. You act out the model war. You act out the model democracy, the model capitalism. Very, very fine, and Popper was completely mistaken that suggesting these were merely explanations invented by 
tell us from social scientists, they're not. They are the stuff of collective life. Well, then the second great problem, ghastly problem, was the problem of historiography. What on earth is history about? History of the human world. And that again in the 19th century, when history became a much more academic subject, much more uh, organized subject, particularly in Germany. And that led to another great debate. Is history merely fiction? Or is history writing a science? And people defended fiercely both those positions and everything in between. There's a chapter on this in my book, The Health of Nations, on this problem of history. And in the 19th century, there developed one view, historismus, we don't really have an English word for it, which takes the view that it can be scientific, you can be objective in the writing of history. Very famously linked to the name of Ranke, German historian, the leading German historian, Ranke. And his famous slogan was, wie es eigentlich gewesen, as it actually was, as it actually happened. And that became the famous slogan against which and in favour of which whole armies of historians aligned themselves. Wie es eigentlich gewesen? Can you ever say what actually happened? Because we can't retrieve the past. Another German who took part in the debate, Meinecke, called history, a marvellous phrase, a schaffender Spiegel, a mirror which creates. In other words, in trying to represent the past, we create the past. Wonderful. And I tend to agree with that myself. Schaffender Spiegel, a creating mirror. Well, the best view, he says, <laughs> out of all this, was one which is the idealist view of history, which comes originally, well, again, it comes from the Greeks, but it came particularly in the 18th century from an Italian, rather eccentric <coughs> Italian writer, Gian Battista Vico, in the 18th century. And the phrase here, the Latin phrase, represents this, verum ipsum factum, reality itself is made. That's the idealist position. Reality doesn't exist until we make it. And the way we make it is the way reality is for us. And this idea was taken out in the 20th century by an Italian philosopher, Benedetto Croce, and by R.G. Collingwood at Oxford. This idealist view of history says that we construct it, not necessarily ideologically. We do our, be do our best to create a good view of the past. Well, the past is very, very important. History is incredibly important. For what reason? Uh, because if you um, think about how you became what you are, it helps you in becoming what you will be. That's the point of history writing. You try to understand how you came to be what you are as a society or whatever. And that helps you in becoming what you will be, helps you in the future. And the correct slogan is the one here under point three. The present is the presence of the past. The present is the presence of the future. We live in this continuum between the past, the present, and the future. And therefore, the past is very, very important. The past of international law, incredibly important in determining its future. So that, as I say, it took me a very long time and years and years of reading to work out these two little points, two and three here. But I offer you them as the basis of what I have been trying to do is the idealist view of the possibility of <coughs> knowledge of the human condition. 
So that puts a huge burden of responsibility on those of us who think about these things because, as I say, we are creating the reality we talk about. Well, then in point four, I created in the book the Anomia models which are supposed to be of the most general possible kind to enable us to talk about social change at every level. I studied social change, not only revolutionary change, the most famous revolutionists, the French, the Russians, and the, Russian and the Chinese, <coughs> but all forms of social change. Fascinating question. How do societies change? Incredibly difficult to work out. But what I suggested, after a good deal of thought, is in point four, that a society is a process, not a thing. A society constitutes itself permanently, every second of every day. And what I suggest is that it constitutes itself in three dimensions, which I call the real, the ideal, and the legal. The real is everyday activity of the people in society and the institutions, and above all, of course, the economy, people active in society. The ideal is society's mind, thinking. Society has ideas about itself, I call them theories about itself, including theories that justify power, because societies are vast power systems, and so they've had to be extremely clever to invent systems that explain and justify power. So every democracy and capitalism are vast idea systems that explain and justify behavior in those societies. And then the legal is a sort of bridge between the real and the ideal. In the legal, society transforms some of its ideas, particularly its values, into law, into a permanent form which modifies the real, modifies the real constitution. People behave in accordance with the law that modifies their behavior and so the law is what I call the presence of the past, which makes the future. Law is an incredible thing. Lawyers are not proud enough of what an extraordinary thing the law is. The law comes from the past. It's a transformation of values into something permanent, which takes effect in the present when it's applied by the courts or by ordinary people. And that changes the future. The, so the future is what society chose to want and use the law to make it happen. So the law is an incredibly ingenious thing. So my analysis of society suggested that every day, every moment, these three things are taking place. <coughs> and so if you want to intervene to cause social change, you have to intervene in one of those three processes. I also suggest also under point four another way of analysing social change, what I call the five dilemmas of social, the sort of dialectical content of society. But every society is using these means, these dimensions, constructing these things that I list here. Identity means that it has to create an idea of itself in relation to others, and the others include the members of society. The dilemma of power is that all societies are a resolution between the one and the many. A society is the one, but it contains many. And a society is one among many societies. And thirdly, the will, the dilemma of value, really, that each individual in society has their own values, but society has values. And that we see particularly, for example, in the human rights world, as an <coughs> attempt to reconcile ordinary behavior with society's highest values. It's called human rights. And similarly, order. The order of the society is an ordering, but so is a human being an ordering. Because the self-constituting of a society is very like the self-constituting of human personality. We are constituting ourselves analogously 
in a real, ideal, and legal way, ourselves individually. And so there's a constant tension, and that's what the great Greek tragedies are about, between two levels of order, the personal order and the social order. And becoming, the last one is very important, because a society is different from second to second. In other words, society is a presence of the past with a future in front of it. And so it has to decide, and that's what conservatives and socialists are about, how much to retain and how much to change every day of the week. That's what politics is about. Politics is about how much shall we retain and how much shall we change to make a better society. So that, those were the ideas I put forward, and I have to say perfectly honestly, sort of 25 years later, or 23 years later, um, I still stick with them. I do find them incredibly useful still for analysing social change. And if you were to bear them in mind, you'd find that sort of reading the newspaper, quite apart from doing your own writing and taking part in judicial proceedings, is greatly facilitated if you have this model in your mind. It's such a mess, isn't it, the human world that we live in? A total mess. We've got to have something to sort it out. Well, then in point five, this is what I've been working on more recently. What are the causes of social change? Why does social change happen? It's obviously not entirely accidental. And I'm giving now enormous primacy to the economy. And you'll guess that it's not unrelated to the globalization of the economy in the world at the moment. The new world we're moving into is, for the time being, dominated by a globalized economy. Well, the economy is a sort of social engine. If you think what engines are or machines are, they produce an output greater than their inputs. If you ride a bicycle, the output is greater than your input. That's what a machine is. A steam engine, the output, you can drag a old train, is greater than the input. <coughs> so the economy is like that. It's a sort of engine of society which drags society along. And what it is, is human energy socialized. <coughs> That's what the economy is. Everybody is working away in a system which produces amazing outputs. Wealth and employment and all the rest of it is produced through the, as it were, engineering of human energy. Well, that means, and I gave a talk about somewhere else about this recently, that means that societies evolve they adapt to a changing world. The great Darwinian word is adaptation. You adapt to a changing world. So society is also a system of adaptation, and I say that evolution is not a metaphor here, it's almost literally true. The great mega-historian Arnold Toynbee, who studied 26 civilizations, explained them all on the basis of two words, challenge and response. All societies progress by meeting challenges. They respond. If they're su successful in their responses, they progress. If they don't, they either remain static or decline. So that's what's going on in the economy at any particular time. And then I suggest in the third line of point five, Having been studying economic history now for some time, I've decided you'll think I'm a terrible simplifier, but it's only for the purpose of getting it on one page. Uh, it's more complicated than this. I suggest on the PMFS, from British history, British his economic history is the most remarkable thing. It's a model for the world. As you know, there are a thousand books have been written on why Britain was the first to have the Industrial Revolution. And in my view, the answer goes back, not only in my view, the answer goes back a very long way to about the 14th century, in which 
very kindly, the Normans, when they invade, invaded England in the 11th century, didn't simply get rid of English law. They didn't simply transform us into France. They allowed Anglo-Saxon law to remain, and they allowed the spirit to remain. And one of those spirits was individualism, a very remarkable thing. We were never a properly feudal society in England. There were elements of feudalism. These wretched Norman French lords took over all the land. But under that, strange things happened, in particular the rise of the middle class. And the secret of economic development, in my view, and again, not only my view, is the rise of the middle class. Because the middle class are fiercely aggressive, aspiring, determined, and they need good politics and good law. In order to increase their wealth and retain their wealth, they need good politics and good law. And so our parliaments, when they began in the 14th century, were the beginning of this sharing of government with the producers of wealth. A part of the secret is in these four things here, where the producer, basically the agricultural producer originally, is then joined by a new character called the merchant, who buys and sells something he has not produced himself. That is the great secret of the beginning of the middle class. And then the, the merchant needs money, loaned money which he doesn't get, get paid, but he needs money to live by, and that he needs the financier, needs banks. And then finally, those three together need the whole structure of society, people, resources, systems, ideas, law, to make their activity work. And I have to say, it may sound sort of Idealizing, idealizing British history, but British economic history, and, and many, including Marx, have taken this view that it is an extraordinary story of um, economic development. It wasn't planned, um, but it's how it happened. And so this, to me, is very relevant to the future international society, because it, there's now a growing middle class across the world. Um, even in China, but also in other, even in Africa, particularly in Latin America. And middle class are huge agents of social change. They demand it. So the idea of a proletarian revolution in early Marxism was mistaken. It's the middle class who are the revolutionaries. Just wanted in point, si uh, point seven to quote Aristotle. Point seven. Thus it is manifest that the best political community is formed by citizens of the middle class, and that those states are likely to be well administered, in which the middle class is large, and larger if possible than both the other classes, or at any rate than either singly, for the addition of the middle class turns the scale and prevents either of the extremes from being dominant. So that was his view, a very Greek view, that this would be a sort of balancing class what happened then was a problem in Europe. I don't want to call the Christian Church a problem, but the Christian Church had something to do with the matter. If you look at point six, to receive interest for lending money is unjust in itself, for something is sold that does not exist. And this obviously results in an inequality which is contrary to justice, according to the philosopher, that's Aristotle. Money was devised to facilitate change, so that the proper and principal use of money is its use or expenditure when exchanges are carried out. Therefore it is wrong in itself to receive a payment for the use of a loan of money, which is called usury. At the, during the period of Christendom in Europe, up to about 1500, that idea was very common, that there was something sinful about lending money on interest. I have to say that the church itself was one of the first to break this rule on a very large <laughs> scale with the bankers of Florence. Um, 
because the church needed lots of money and had to get it from somewhere. But this, in some sense, <coughs> held back the development of mere commerce in Europe. Europe was in some sense a static society until the merchant arose and the financier arose, just sort of suddenly. Um, well, then the second point in five is another cause of social change, which we idealists believe in rather strongly, which is that the human species, and I've written about this recently, the human species is a very odd thing. Out of what has been called the primordial sludge at the beginning of time, beginning of life on Earth, there has emerged a very peculiar species which is self-evolving and self-perfecting. We've sort of taken over evolution. Our brains are such that we can control our habitat, we can control our response to our habitat, and we can even, self-perfecting, choose to be better. And you tend to forget in reading the newspapers which are endlessly full of criticism, oh, how everything is wrong, everything is broken, nothing works. You tend to forget our society since about, in Europe, I'm now speaking, since about uh, 1400, have been massive engines of progress. <coughs> Incredible. In other words, we have developed the idea, and there were many civilizations that were more or less static. But at some point, we realized we could choose to be better, and that society could always be better tomorrow than it was yesterday. That's an amazing thing. And that made us sort of masters of our own fate, of our own future. We can want to be better than we are. That's the belief of progress. And where does it come from? Well, we idealist philosophers believe it comes from two very powerful ideas, the transcendental and the ideal. And they mean that above the goings-on of society, everyday society, we can have still higher ideas that are not merely socialized ideal, ideas, but are supra-social ideas. We can think about ultimate things. And human rights, I, I gave some lectures on human rights saying this fairly recently. Human rights are a marvelous example. They were an idea of bringing in some transcendental values into the socialized system, let's say into social law. So in these, this idea of higher values, we are able to judge what we do. That's the extraordinary thing. And we can judge that things are bad and that something else would be good. And that means we're a self-transforming species. Every society is capable of self-transforming and self-perfecting. And in point eight, I um, suggest that this is a cross-cultural idea First, a quotation from a classical <coughs> Chinese philosopher, who I here identify as Mo Ti. I prefer Mo Tzu. Any Chinese speakers here? Mo You prefer Mo Ti? Mo Ti. <laughs> Speak to me afterwards, I'd love to get it correct. Um, and it's sometimes referred to as Mo Ti in a single word. But he, I regard as a sort of Chinese baker, really. And this is what he said. That being so, what standard may be taken as suitable for ruling? The answer is that nothing is equal to imitating heaven. Heaven's actions are all inclusive and not private-minded, its blessings substantial and unceasing, its revelations abiding and incorruptible. Well, to put that in simpler terms, what he's saying is that there is a transcendental level, which in the English translation we always call heaven, I don't know quite what the Chinese um, sense of the word is, 
But the important thing is that that is suggesting that above all the goings on of society and human life, there is another set of values, and that that even applies to rulers, the states, the governments. That's a very. And then a quotation from Plato, who, of course, is the master of this view quote, Will they distrust our statement that no city could ever be blessed? unless its lineaments were traced by artists who used the heavenly model. And that's a very brief statement of page and pages and pages of Plato, <coughs> who, I have to say, I feel I should do him a bit of honour on this occasion, succeeded in introducing the idea of the ideal into the conscious human mind. We would not be where we are, we wouldn't be in this room without the idea of the ideal as a standard trying to improve us. And he did a wonderful job uh, so long ago in causing this to be a presence in our consciousness. And then thirdly, a quotation from one of the Upanishads. Um, and these three words in Sanskrit Tattvam Asi, forgive me, in Sanskrit speakers present, um, which can be translated either as that art thou or you are that, is often represented as the absolute essence in three words of Hindu philosophy. The idea being that that is the everything, the all, the universe. And this, these three words mean that you, just a humble individual human being, are part of everything, of the all. And so even states and governments are part of the all. And therefore their values mustn't simply be limited to the values that they create socially. So what I'm suggesting in point eight, obviously, again, forgive me for being so ludicrously briefly, and what I'm suggesting is that common to cultures, this is relevant to a globalized world, common to very important cultures, is an inherent idea of <coughs> high values, high purposes, possibility of human self-judging, and therefore the possibility of human self-improving, self-perfecting. Um, so that, in this very brief, I took enormous effort to put it on one sheet of paper, that in very brief form is the package that I offer you. Um, it's terribly easy to grasp. And I always say that it takes about a second to install this all in your mind. And thereafter, you will not be the same person ever again. And obviously our job now, for those who believe in this, is to find some way of communicating this to the world in general. And that is the exciting thing. We're talking now just about, not just about Britain or Europe, but about the world. How could we transform the world, the human world? And that's why in recent years I've turned to writing novels, because I've tried to find some way of causing this to disseminate itself, and I've been suggesting doing that by imagining a conspiracy in these novels of very intelligent and very rich people who make it their aim in life to communicate this sort of stuff to the world and to push governments aside because governments by and large are the cause of most of the evils of the world. So we've got to find some way of transcending governments and some way of creating <coughs> what might seem like an ideal world, <coughs> but at least, God willing, might be a better world. Okay, I'll stop. <coughs> who um, had some difficulties with installing this
package within one second in their mind and first would like to request some further clarifications uh, before they could succeed in doing so. Next. Um, what is um, the ideal? What is heavenly as Plato says? Right. And how do we go about determining it? Well, you sort of know it when you see it, I think. <laughs> um, the idea, and that's why the beginning part of the talk is relevant, I'm not suggesting that these are in the physical essence of the world, but they are ideas that once you, things like beauty and goodness and justice and so on, once you do accept them as sort of supervising ideas, judging all other ideas, then that transforms something. I'm not saying that they exist. I haven't heard that I've, on other occasions I've created a marvelous passage in Plato where he answers the very point you just made. It says, I'm not for a moment suggesting that these things exist, but I am suggesting that if you accept them, your life will be transformed. Because he, he knew that the sophists in ancient Greece said this is all nonsense. You know, and he had an interlocutor who said, well, we all know what justice is. It's the, the will of the more powerful. Um, and his whole life was devoted, Plato, to trying to get people to understand that if you accept <coughs> this idea of a particular kind of idea called the ideal, and then you can debate what the content of it is at any particular moment. But if you accept the forming idea, as he called it, then everything is transformed. Um, how would you um, understand the triangular um, relation between politics, economy, and law? Uh, because I know that um, Arist uh, Aristotle has a very nice theory on the, the, the relation between um, the economy and uh, politics. And how would you uh, yeah, see the role of law in, in that relation? Well, politics, I'm sorry, I didn't have time to say more about <laughs> politics. Politics is, again, this is a possible model of politics. When one uses the word is, you must always understand that yeah. it's not an essentialist view. Politics is a remarkable thing. It is the transformation of individual self-interest into common interest. That's the purpose and nature of politics. <coughs> not only in democratic politics, but in any politics, that's what's going on. Everybody, all human beings, have self-interest. And for most human beings, it's the survival and prospering of their family. And as you know, Aristotle starts really with the family. The family is an economy. The family is a little political system. And <coughs> so what politics does is, again, it's a sort of engineering uh, <coughs> analogy. Politics, anybody can contribute. Anybody can show it. Everybody has different interests. But when they come together systematically, out of it can come something which is deemed to be the common interest because it is turned into law. Law, on this view, is the materialization of the common interest as determined through politics. And so law again, one has to be careful because in everyday life law can be absolutely dreadful but, and can be misused unspeakably. But law in principle can be the materialising of the common interest. And that means that when law is then applied, people become agents of the common interest. If you apply the law, even avoiding parking on double yellow lines, you're an agent of the common interest. Isn't that amazing? If you obey the law, it's as long as the law is, is rightly represented as the common interest in a particular case. But each of us as a citizen is an agent of the common interest. That's a wonderful thing. 
And then, if you don't like the law, you can shout and argue and protest and demonstrate and try and get it changed and get a different conception of the common interest. And so democracy, I have to say, what we call liberal democracy, is the best way in which that has ever been achieved because it maximizes the participation in the political process. You don't have to participate. You can keep quiet. You don't have to vote. But if you want to, you can cause a change in the conception of the common interest. And then the democratic systems have fabulously complicated. They're legal systems. Democracy is a legal system in which we all have rights and duties. But when it is engineered into a system, it is a wonderfully efficient way. And the economy, then, is a legal system. The economy is a product of the conception of the common interest, that there should be people able to make money, that they should be able to make buy and sell, and so on, that there should be inequalities of wealth. That's all created by the law. I I have two questions in the back. Shall we take them together? Is it okay? Or is it okay to take three questions? Right. Yeah. So, Margareta, I see. Okay. You'll have to shout. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this, for this wonderful lecture. Um, um, my, my question is um, actually how your idea relates to um, international law as a system as it is understood in mainstream legal thinking today. And, and I'd like to, um, to refer to an article that you wrote in 1988 on state responsibility. And, and at the end of it, um, you made a few very clear proposals on how to move international law forward, including uh, recognition of individuals as subjects of international law, recognition of um, state practice as, as custom um, and um, of justice and also an objective in, of international law and then the appointment of an international law commission made of uh, not of states but representatives of, of people and then tasking that commission with um, drafting a global constitution and most other things forgive me if I, if I misquote you but um, mm. the question is um, whether these proposals would still be valid today after 25 years and whether they would um, you know, move international law in, in the direction of these transcendental values. Well, I have to say that I regret that I said all that if I said it, because <laughs> um, I never go in for practical suggestions. Um, uh, the only vaguely practical thing I would suggest is the restoration of the concept of customary international law. This is a bit of a uh, King Charles's head of my thinking. A terrible thing has happened over the last 25 years. That the notion of customary international law has been destroyed. And as you know, it's it, it, unbelievable that people, including the International Court of Justice, are more or less saying the customary international law is a collection of the opinions of governments. Oh. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Customary international law participates in one of the oldest legal phenomena in human history, customary law, which is, a, I wrote an article about it in 1971, called Language Method and the Nature of International Law. It, it, it's, I can't speak about it now, obviously it's too detailed, but that would be one thing to restore a correct conception of customary international law, and that is incredibly important. But the other things, as I say, I don't suggest institutional change. Somebody reminded me that I would called the International Law Commission the uh, in-house counsel to the mob of all mobs. <laughs> 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 and I'm grateful to them for having reminded me of that because I think it's absolutely correct. And the International <laughs> Law Commission still exists. And they still draw their salaries and their pensions and whatever. So all that is dreadful. But my question would be how, under your premises, international law is anything special at all? Because it seems to me to be rather uh, but a more universal instance of law in general, so nothing special essentially. Absolutely. I wish I'd said that. <laughs> now that is the whole point. Uh, that international law is just another 
person of law. And law is a miracle, as I suggested. Law is a wonder. And Rousseau went on about the wonder and miracle of the law. Law is the most wonderful thing. And so, in my view, it's not a question of extrapolating from national law. It's just recognizing that the world must have a legal system. All collective social efforts since the dawn of time have had legal systems of some sort. Um, and so I, I agree with your formulation, absolutely, that's the whole point. But it means that we have to understand law. And as you know, there are only about 50,000 books on what <laughs> law is. <coughs> and so I have to put forward a view of what law is that I've tried to communicate today. And it's that that I see at the global level, not the views of law of thousands of other people who put forward, but that particular view that I put forward. Um, yes, if, if law um, is formed by, um, we form the common interest through the process of politics and democracy, um, aren't democratic institutions organised by the state? Um, therefore, isn't the role of the state very important in working out how democracy is going to work and to try and make sure that everyone can participate in democracy and it's not just the you know, certain elites? Right. And therefore, why would we want the role of the state in international law to diminish in the new era? Well, it depends what you mean by state. Because, as you know, state has an inward-looking meaning and outward-looking meaning. A state internally in society is what uh, some countries call the whole governmental machine, the state. We in Americans don't have an internal concept of the state. Occasionally people refer to state schools and that sort of thing. We do not. There is no such thing as the state in the conceptualization of the English system or in America. There is government, obviously. But this continental idea, l'état, the idea that there is a great monolithic thing internally, what French also call le pouvoir, the power. We in the Americans regard that as incredibly dangerous because it's the sort of essentializing of something which becomes extremely dangerous. And in fascism and totalitarianism, we discovered how dangerous the idea of the state can become because the state justifies itself, apparently, Whatever it does is right. So the state internally is something that we would want to object to very strongly. Obviously, as you say, there has to be a governmental level which organizes everything and a rational civil service which tries to introduce some rationality into the forming of the common interest. Uh, and the government has a sort of arbitrating, umpiring role in politics, which it then has to try and steer in the direction it wants. But it's only steering, it's sort of pilot to a helmsman of the government, steering the system. And, and in our tradition, we object strongly to the idea that it is in some sense sovereign. It isn't. In Britain and America, we have no sovereigns. The Queen isn't sovereign. And certainly the three branches of government are not sovereign. They are under the law. They have exactly the powers that the law gives them. The law is us forming the common interest. So the government for us is our servant on this view. It is not our master. It is there to do what we ultimately want as ordinary people. Externally, the state is a terribly troubling, and again, 50,000 books <coughs> on the external state. Uh, and it all goes back to Vattel, but I can only refer you to chapter 14 of the Health of Nations where I have a bit of a go at Vattel. Uh, because this was very convenient in the 18th century. States in external sense had become <coughs> real actors of international affairs. There were a very limited number of these European states that had suddenly perceived themselves as the masters of everything. It was only about seven or eight states. And so Vattel had to invent a system that could control <laughs> these people, the, these powers, as they were called, who ran the international system on the basis of national interest. 
And he did a very good job. It's a very clever system, an Italian system. As I say, he treated these persons with interests and duties and values. And uh, the governments of those states loved this. To be told that they were somehow representatives of the ultimate order of the universe was <laughs> wonderful. And they loved it. And Patel was extremely popular. Um, and it, that idea has dominated almost until the present time. Everything, international law, then, is that law on a horizontal system between these pseudo-personified entities. Well, I mean, my main theme, obviously, <coughs> is that will not continue. It will no, not be simply a horizontal system in the future. It's already incredibly vertical. Economic <coughs> phenomena flow across frontiers, freely, vertically, meeting everywhere. Governments are becoming sort of residual in relation to these transnational phenomena. And so the idea that the international system is merely an extrapolation upwards of these things it just is not appropriate. Next week we'll continue with a topic that governments love externally, namely immunity, with Lady Hazel Fox. So I all welcome you to next week's um, lecture, the last lecture of this term. But now I would like to thank Cambridge University Press for its uh, support for these lectures. And of course, our speaker, it has been a great honor and it's been most inspiring to have you here.